Um, so I'm going to I'm going to start off with some of the kind of fundamentals, which I'll I'll I'll, I'll have a, a bit of a fast start for because I know most of the people in this room probably know all this stuff. But essentially, um, when we're talking about pacing, we're talking about probably one of the most used definitions of this is this distribution of distribution of work, pattern of energy expenditure during an exercise task or what Zig um, says, you know, having some kind of strategy that enables you to get to the end in the best and pos uh, possible time for the individual. So it's, uh, it's the way that you decide, I suppose, in a sense, and I use the term decide um, quite loosely at this point, and we'll come on to that in a minute, uh, how to distribute your effort and energy throughout a race in order to perform at the best. So um, there's been quite a lot of literature, obviously, about different types of pacing strategy and which ones are more effective than others. Broadly speaking, they can be classified as, as, as six, so um, all that pacing strategy, sort of thing you might see in a 100 meter event. Positive pacing strategy, you know, where you adopt a very fast start. Uh, one of the disadvantages of this, of course, is that you use up metabolic reserves quite early on, and then the uh, consequence of it is that there's just a diminishment of speed throughout even pacing or stochastic pacing, which perhaps time trialers might use, I think. Um, Louis published something on this in one of his mathematical specials at some point. And, um, and then negative pacing, where you start slow and gradually increase, and then a very common pacing strategy that we see is a sort of combination of negative and positive, where you, you have a bit of a fast start, settle down in the middle, and then you, you have, um, have a bit of a, um, I'm not going to use the word end spurt, because I essentially um, set their pace. Now, this is one of the, this is a, a kind of, a reworking essentially of the central governor model which I'm sure lots of you will have seen this uh, template and, and others like it before and um, I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with central governor there's elements of it that I that I quite like um, I mean if nothing else I quite like it because it's got everyone thinking about uh, pace and control and limits of performance in a slightly different way it's got it's certainly got everybody um, carefully thinking about their own ideas about how how um, how uh, races are run and how um, and, and how athletes control effort during exercise. So in that sense, it's it's quite provocative and it gets everybody uh, talking and thinking about these issues um, more. But there are some things about central government that do trouble me, if I'm completely honest with you. One of them is in relation to this anticipatory component. So, and, and a big focus of the, the, the stuff I'm going to show you a bit later on in this talk is about just how complicated a psychological process is to be able to um, uh, anticipate a, a future event, to be able to, um, uh, to, be able to think about how uh, things might unfold in the future and what all of the possible range of likely outcomes are and then to be able to make a decision that will um, give you the best chance of um, coping with those um, unfolding circumstances is, is a very complicated psychological process that involves a lot of abstract thought. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on but one of the things with, the, with this model is that um, with the stroke of a pen the anticipatory component is just assumed to be more or less accurate. And if it's not accurate, and there's lots of reasons why it isn't accurate, um, the model will fall down. Another problem in my mind is that there's, there's not much recognition of the distinction between sensation and perception. And perception of effort is, um, is, is often also treated in models like this as a constant, as if it only is, is the same all the time. I mean, I know that Sam has wrote quite a lot about, you know, RPE not being... Um, you know, a, a simple combination of all the afferent feedback that comes from physiology. And that's true, and a lot of the work that we've done has shown that you can change RPE independent of the, of, of the afferent signal. I'm not saying that, you know, afferent signals from the periphery are not important. They do contribute, in my view. I mean, that's probably perhaps where Sam and I differ a little bit. But, um, but we, we need to recognise that there's a difference between raw sensory signal and perception, which involves... Um, interpretation of those uh, sensations. Um, it's very biased, this model, towards interreception. So there's very little, um, there's very, very little takes into account external influences. So uh, extraceptive influences on one on RPE and one on um, pacing regulation. 
There's very little about this, about individual differences. And again, one of the things I'll hope to show you a bit later on is some, um, is how in individual differences in risk perception affect the kind of pacing decisions that individuals make. And, um, you know, there are also problems with this model about whether or not you can really test it. I mean, you know, in a sense, it's a, there's, a, there's a degree of unfalsifiability to it. It's a, it's a kind of, you know, certainly with the technology we've got at the moment, you can't test this model exclusively. And um, it's a bit like, a, you know, it's a, it's a bit like the kind of God principle. It's very difficult to prove that there's a God, but it's also very difficult to disprove that there's a God either. And central governor for me is, in terms of a scientific problem, Sort of, it's sort of there really. It's very difficult to prove it or disprove it. Um, and finally, I, I, I don't, you know, I, I know that um, uh, Weir wrote this this review of central government a few years ago. And one of the things that was pointed out, one of the criticisms that was levelled at it, is that it might be relevant to, to certain tasks and certain types of activities, but for other types of activities, it probably isn't. And uh, it's more difficult to apply in that way. So in that sense, as a as a, uh, as a model of effort regulation or as a model of fatigue, it's quite difficult to generalise because there are situations where central governor does fall to pieces a bit. So, but, you know, so that's why I've got a bit of a love-hate relationship with it. I like it in some ways and in other ways I find it um, slightly problematic. So, so why, why did I get involved in this problem in the first place? Well, firstly I was quite disappointed when I looked at my own literature in my own field of psychology just at, at how little we, we, we've done on fatigue. I mean, it's staggering, really. I mean, you know, when you look at the physiology literature, there's, there's thousands of papers on, on fatigue, thousands and thousands of papers. When you look at the sport and exercise psychology literature, when you think about how fundamental the problem of fatigue and effort regulation is to performance, it's, it's like a handful of papers. We're, we're just not looking at this problem. Psychologists are not looking at this problem. We've got something really useful we can add to it as well. So that was one reason. This is the journals. This is, uh, you know, this is just keyword journals. You have to just look what psych physiology journals have done, what psychologists have done. It's just pathetic, really. I mean, it's, this should be really absolutely one of the key things that psychologists do. Another reason I, that I got quite interested in is because I went to an awful ACSM conference at Nashville. I'd never go there. It's an awful place, unless you're really into country and western music. And um, listen to Tim and, and, and Tim Noakes and his, and his colleagues talking about central government. I found it really quite interesting. I had an opportunity to speak to him afterwards and things. And um, it culminated in an opportunity to go out and work in his lab on sabbatical for about six months. And that was in, um, that was in 2007. So I spent a bit of time um, in the hornet's nest, so to speak, um, working in his lab and doing some of this stuff. Check the hair out. <coughs> sort of had a few issues then. Um, so, so, so I, I became really quite interested in this, this subject. So, so what I'm going to what I'm going to show you um, is, a, is a few studies that have led led me to believe that um, you know about how important um, risk perception in individuals is, and how important decision making processes is, is in individuals to pacing and and, and control. So, this was the study that, that I did in South Africa with Tim. Essentially, we had three. It was a quite a complicated design, but we had uh, subjects uh, randomly allocated into three conditions. They were good, they were good cyclists. They came from a, a cycling club in Cape Town, pretty good standard. And uh, they um, were either put into a blind um, feedback condition, an accurate feedback condition, or a false feedback condition. The first two time trials here were kind of used as uh, familiarisation, but they were also used as a kind of a sort of way of conditioning athletes to get them used to cycling with different types of information. So in the, in the blind time trial, we didn't, we, we didn't give them any information at all. So they just simply had to cycle for 20 kilometres, best they possibly could, no performance feedback information at all. In this one, they just had a normal, you know, calibrated cycling computer that was accurate. And in the final, final one, we messed around with the cycle computer to make them think they were going 5% faster than they actually were. In the third time trial, we completely blinded all of the subjects and in the fine final time trial, we made them all have accurate feedback. So in a way, we kind of conditioned them at the beginning to get used to a particular type of performance. In this case, the most interesting um, condition is the false feedback condition because they were led to believe after several time trials that they were capable of, say, cycling 40 kilometres an hour when in actual fact they're only talking along at 38 because the bike was showing them 5% 
on. Okay. Okay, blind time trial. So this is what they did, 10 minutes warm up. Um, they all did this and then we asked them at various um, uh, stages to indicate uh, their RPE. So when they actually reached 4, 8, 12, 16 and 20, we asked them to give their RPE. We also asked them to state their RPE out loud when they felt they'd reached those distances. They didn't know that we were asking at those distances. And then we were able to work out what the error was, basically. So this is a bit about time perception. I'm not going to focus on this because I don't want to talk about it. The interesting thing that I do want to talk about is the interviews that, that we conducted for the athletes afterwards to ask them about how they pace themselves in blind circumstances. So in, uh, this is the blind feedback group. And there's no surprises here. Um, essentially, in the blind feedback group, um, they, they just have a, a more or less flat pace and then when you give them information, lo and, lo, lo and behold, um, they have a sprint finish. And then um, in the accurate feedback group, uh, you get the opposite effect. So you take information away and then their pacing just goes completely flat. So, so the one of the interesting things about this, you know, you can talk about the merits or otherwise of blinding studies and deception studies and things like that, but one of the interesting things about this is that what we're essentially doing is we're creating a situation of uncertainty or greater uncertainty for the athletes and it's causing them to make a decision in how they pace these events. That's one thing. This is the, this is the really interesting group. So this is the false feedback group. So they start off really, really fast, right? So probably comparable to their prior experience. Bearing in mind that they are now getting the real performance data. They're getting the true reflection of what they're doing, not the false one that we've conditioned them to believe. And so uh, this information <coughs> has caused them to increase their speed right at the beginning, quite substantially, actually. Um, and then the reason these are different, obviously, is because they cycled 5% less in the, in the, other, in the other trial. Um, one thing I want to talk about is their RPE scores. Now, you can't really see it there, but when you look at the differences in RPE between the false feedback group and the accurate feedback group, you can see that certainly at the beginning, like, the difference is almost two ball points. It's almost as if... <coughs> it's almost as if their prior experience is causing them to interpret and make decisions on their feelings in a different way. Right? It's, it's as if you can um, dupe these cyclists into changing their pacing strategy or into making a decision about their pace based on how they feel because of a prior experience that they've had. And that's probably very relevant. Okay? So, um, you know... Anyone that does exercise regularly will probably have a regular run route or a cycle route. And some days it just feels a bit more difficult for whatever reason. We, quite difficult to pinpoint why. But often you will just press on with it because you put it down to a bad day. You say, well, I know I can do this in this particular time. I'm going to press on with it. It feels a bit more uncomfortable, but that's what's happening. So you can, you can get a change in perceived exertion by messing around with their experience. But by, you know, I, I believe that RP is partly a, a consequence of, of, of expectation. Yeah? And that expectation is primed by previous experiences that athletes have had. Now this was quite interesting. So in the blind condition, we, we you know, when, when all of these cyclists were, were interviewed afterwards about how they, how they approach this problem of of, of t pacing themselves blind. They all talked about things like counting cadence. We stopped that one straight away. But things like this, visualisation of a familiar route, using warm-up as reference time, how I feel, how I feel, but plus a bit extra, so not confident even in their feelings. Music in the gym, you know, tracks three minutes. You know, know roughly how long it takes. You know, I just count the tracks that go through on music, that kind of stuff. I mean, one person even tried to use the shadow as a sundial uh, on, on outside. This was Cape Town, remember? Um, the, the weird thing about that was it was a corrugated roof, so I don't know how that was working. But anyway, but the point about this is that when you create uncertainty, when an athlete is in an uncertain condition, they do one thing, right? And that is to seek out information. That's a tendency that an athlete will have. When, when uncertainty increases, what they will try to do is seek out another reference point. It's just new human nature. We do it all the time. Um, so uh, I'm going to just skip through these because I want to get on to some of the, some of the other ones. 
The reason that, that might be relevant, I guess, is because, is because a lot of the models about pacing are quite RP-centric. Yeah. So like this, is, this, is, this is one of the, the kind of models. So the idea is, is that what we try to do when we pace ourselves is keep our RP on a kind of trajectory that will mean peak RP will coincide with whatever the end point is. And if you have a different end point, you have a different RP trajectory. And, you know, Roger Eston's done absolutely loads of work on this stuff, and it's, it's, it's very interesting, and it's true, but, um, again, one of, the, one of the sort of slight concerns I have about this is the, is the problem of being able to anticipate RP trajectory. So in order for a, a person to be able to do this, to alter their pace based on this RP trajectory, they need to be able to conceptualise what their RP will be at different points in the future. And that's a difficult, that's a, a very complicated psychological process, cognitive process. It involves abstract thought. It's, it's, it's a really kind of tricky thing. Right? So, and, and the other thing is, is that often in some events we don't necessarily see linear increases in RPE. It just doesn't necessarily transpire in that way. It's a number of studies that we've done, but this is one example that I'll give where you see difference. And it, uh, except this is a multi a multi, uh, you know, multi-discipline sport. It's an Ironman in Austria, and I took some field data for this. But you know, immediately you can see what RP is doing in the swim. I mean, if that trajectory carried on, they would be, you know, they would be absolutely done really, really quickly. But yet, somehow, athletes think that's okay to do that, and it is okay to do that. It's fine to, you know, a coping mechanism of, um, you know, that athletes might adopt in very, very long races. It's actually not to think about the endpoint too much. That might be something that works. It's like, you know, some of you do marking, right? What's the first thing you do when you get your marking? You, you put it into bunches of five, don't you? Because you just can't bear the thought of a hundred. Yeah, so that's what you do. It's a, kind of, it's a kind of cognitive coping strategy for dealing with very, very long things. So there is a possibility, and, and this sort of data seems to show this, that actually athletes sometimes break events down into smaller manageable chunks and they have kind of almost sub-pacing strategies. They make decisions based on discrete points in the future that they know are coming along. That might be, um, they might be related to landmarks, for instance. I mean, this is some data from a child pacing study. We saw this in very young children, uh, where we asked them to run laps. Now, as it happens, what you see is, certainly in the middle section, you see this oscillation in pace. Right, so this is as they're running away from the start straight finish line, and this is, this is when they're coming back in. Running away, coming back in, running away, coming back in. So you, you see as they're running away from the finish line, they're slowing down. As they sort of see the finish line, they're speeding up again. So you get this kind of pattern. So evidence that I suppose that, pe that, that even in quite short events like this, that, that people have this tendency to break things down. So I think that would be, be, be remiss of me as a psychologist not to have some kind of perceptual trick in here. I mean, I don't know what you think that looks like, but I think that looks like, um, like Snoopy a bit. Um, in actual fact, it is the, the course of the London Marathon. So if you just think about what I've been saying in the context of the London Marathon, do people, when they start in Greenwich Park, do they really think about Pall Mall? Do they really sort of pace themselves to Pall Mall? Or... Do they think about it in a slightly different way? Do they break it down? Right? Do they think about different landmarks, different bits? I'll get myself to that bit, then I'll worry about the next bit. Probably it's a bit of both, actually. But in, in long events, it's, it's probably a strategy that works. And it's a strategy that holds together with what we know about the way humans organise complex information in the world. And one of the things that we are very good at as human beings is being able to make sense of... Um, partial information. We're able to make inferences and deductions and conclusions that are often correct about information that's very, very partial. You might say, you're looking at these things, and that's a circle, a triangle, and, and a square. In actual fact, it's just a collection of dots, but it does broadly represent that. And we're able to fill the missing information in and be able to make that, 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 that leap. So, so this ability to be able to attend to very selected cues and then make um, you know, judgments about its meaning is, is, is probably very um, relevant to the way athletes make sense of complex environments during a race. So now we come on to the, the thing that I'm really um, getting quite interested in, which is this idea that athletes need to be able to, if, if the central governor model holds together and if these RPE control models hold together, 
they need to be able to do something that's really quite interesting, which is to be able to uh, engage in uh, prospection. Right? And what we mean by prospection, really, is being able to mentally simulate the future. They need to be able to... You know, if you're going to keep your RP on a trajectory, you need to be able to have some kind of idea about how your RP is likely to change given a number of different unfolding situations in a race. And that, you know, if you think about the endless possibilities that could happen in a race, it could be a change in the weather, it could be a change in the way you feel, there could be a change in competitor behaviour, there's, there's numerous ways in which these things can unfold. Lots of, lots of evidence in the psychology literature about prospective um, about prospective thought and um, you know and the involvement of the brain in that side of things. Um, prefrontal cortex, for instance, damaged patients are, are known to struggle with prospective thought. They can often, um, you know, they're often described as being in the present. These these patients, you know, if you ask them about what they're doing now, they can answer very well. If you ask them what they're doing tomorrow, they often they can't do it. They struggle with that kind of thing. And these particular bits of the brain have been linked to prospective thought. So you ask people to engage in prospective thought and then those parts of the brain light up. But interestingly, one of the, one of the things is that young children struggle with this. Right? They don't have the kind of cognitive capabilities to be able to um, you know, engage in prospective thought. So, so this kind of got us thinking. And we thought, well, why don't we try to measure this in children? Why don't we try to see whether or not children can kind of you know, engage or, or perform anticipatory pacing. So what we did was we got children of lots of different ages, as young as five, okay, very young children, and as old as 14, and we asked, we, we, we kind of um, time corrected the distance that they were asked to run. So we wanted it to be roughly three minutes. So as it turns out, after a bit of pilot testing, five-year-olds roughly took three minutes to run 450 metres, 14-year-olds roughly 900 metres in three minutes, something like that, unless they were really good athletes at that stage already. But that was broadly what we did. So we, so, so we did this kind of thing. We got them to, um, we videoed it uh, to, to get the pacing, but we got them to do a number of kind of quite common um, tasks. And, and some of these tasks, which, which enable you to kind of classify children according to their cognitive abilities, particularly their ability for abstract thought and reasoning, is uh, Piaget's conservation tasks. And this is an example of one of the conservation tasks. So you present the child with two glasses of water um, in, in an identical shaped um, receptacle. In front of the child, you say, watch this, you pour one into a shorter, flatter glass, and then you say, is the amount of water in the glass is the same or different now? And children that are able to... Um, uh, think about the transformation but still recognise the volume of water is the same, are able to say, well, it's, it's the same, even though it's changed shape. Younger children can't do this. They're not capable of... They just see a different size and they just say, well, it's different now. It's a different amount of water. And there's lots of different versions of this that you can do. One of them we did was two pieces of string in a line and then we made one into the shape of a running track. And the young children would often say, oh, well, that's shorter now than the, than the line. So, so, it, so the purpose of that really was, I guess, to just classify, classify these kids according to their conservation score. And this is what we saw. So, unsurprisingly, the younger kids, the ones that had um, either virtually no conservation ability or very small amount of conservation ability, just went off like absolute nutters. Right? So they went off like hares, right? uh, with no thought for the future. <laughs> Absolutely none whatsoever. Right? Didn't really care, just thought, that's it, I'm off, and they were off, and that was that. But the older children, interestingly, well, they, they were able to, to, to give this some thought. Now, obviously, these children are capable of running at that speed to start off. They were able to give it a little bit of thought and held back, which is quite interesting. So it's sort of more evidence that as these children get older, that they're able to engage perhaps in the kind of prospective thought that, that causes them to decide... I need to take this easy to start off with because later on there's going to be a cost. Now we did correct all this sort of stuff for age and that kind of stuff. I won't go into that now. I don't think this, this video will work. Oh yeah, it does. Here you go. So faces blanked out. This is first lap, last lap. So you just get an idea. Look at the background, how different the progress is. Just, just off like a nutter. No care or concern in the world for, you know, I've got another four laps to do. Doesn't really give a monkey's off he goes, and that's that. You know, I'll worry about that later on. So, so right. So quite interesting now is 
So why do we fail? Sometimes athletes fail. Right? We've published a paper on this. Lots of different reasons about this. Um, yeah, I'm not sure about this foster collapse positions thing. You know, I mean, you, you, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's mildly amusing, I suppose, to get something like that in sports <laughs> made. And that's, that's actually Gavin Sandercock, a, a friend of mine who I work with. But um, lots of different reasons were, were, were specified in this paper. But sometimes, sometimes pacing in athletes does go wrong. And I'm going to talk about perhaps some of the reasons why that might happen. Um, but first of all, I want you to watch this video. How are we doing for time? How do we get this to work? There we go. All right, so just watch this quickly. We have no time here, but you'll, you'll, you'll get the idea. So, I mean, actually, many might argue that was a more or less perfectly paced race in the sense that he's got absolutely nothing left in the tank. I mean, he didn't, he's, he came tenth in that race as it happens, but, <clears throat> you know, a lot of people would say, you know, if you can walk over the finish line, get your car, get all your stuff back in the car, drive on, all that, it's all, that's all wasted metabolic energy. You should just use it in the race. Um, but it does go wrong sometimes. So you do collapse occasionally. And experienced athletes as well. So why? Some reasons, some reason probably because of the physiology. There you go, good old full foster. Full foster. Yeah, get over there. I have to say, Carl was very uncomfortable about his name being put to those positions. Hey, I'm sure many of you have seen this. <laughs> so, this is a half foster developing into a full foster. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it is very sad actually. I mean, both, both this, this is Sean Welsh and Wendy Ingham. Both, both of them survived it and they went on to race as well afterwards. But it is, you know, the fact that athletes get to this stage, I mean, you know, both, both taken to the hospital after this. Yeah. Yeah, she made it as well eventually. It doesn't always work out that way. So why does it happen? Well, the reason, one of the reasons it might happen is because this prospective thought is, is an imperfect system, essentially. So there are instances where your ability to simulate the future will reflect what actually happens in the future. So your ability to think about an unfolding situation in a race and, and crucially, how you might feel in the future in that situation could be accurate, in which case it's quite likely that your pre-feeling and therefore your subsequent decision that you make will be a good one. But there's lots of reasons why your, your, um, your, your kind of prospective thought might not be accurate, for instance. So if, for instance, your memory, prospective thought involves combining um, perceptual information, so information that's happening in the, in the present with memories of events or similar events that have occurred in the past. Now if those memories or events that have occurred in the past are in, are in some way, um, well should we say romanticised, imagine if you, you win, a, you know, after a, an absolute horrendous battle, an athlete is triumphant and, and gets themselves a gold medal and wins an event, it's quite likely that that pain and misery of going through that race will be somewhat romanticised because the outcome was positive. It turned out to be a very positive emotional experience. Think about Montoya, or whatever her name is, in that other race. She came forth, didn't even make it onto the podium. So, so she might you know, have a much more negative um, emotional association with that experience. So the next time she thinks about that situation, that might affect the way she um, thinks about her pace. It might affect the way she simulates what might happen in the future because, because the memory is being somehow it's altered, it's different, it's not, it doesn't necessarily ref ref reflect reality. So if that happens, then it's quite likely that you will make 
a bad pacing decision. And, and, and ironically, if you are always... I mean, one of the things I used to talk about is that it's really good for athletes to lose sometimes and to fail. Because they don't fail, then, you know, they will always have a, a kind of positive association with their, their type of behaviour. And that, in a way, might lead them to make pacing mistakes in the future. It might lead them to make overly optimistic pacing judgments early on. So there's absolutely stacks of literature on, on prospective uh, simulation. But this is, this is a very complex, complex kind of process. It's applied in all kinds of different ways. I mean, for instance, you know, prospective simulation sometimes goes wrong with food. So, for instance, you, you, you know that, um, I don't know, that strawberries and cream goes together. You know, if you said to someone that's never had strawberries and cream, you know, what do you think about this? They would probably go, yeah, that would seem to work for me. I mean, you, 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 can, you can think about events in the future that you've never experienced before, and humans are able to do that. Animals and young children can't find it much more difficult. But if you said to someone, what about balsamic vinegar and strawberries, for instance? That's a bit more tricky. So their, their memory of balsamic vinegar and strawberries separately, they might think, well, actually, that's not going to work. So, so they, they can, you know, their pre-feeling about that will probably be a negative one, even though it's lovely. So, so context as well is also very important. So this is what's happening in the, in the present here. So contextual factors. So how does context and perception interact with each other? Let's have a little look. Right, so this is, one, this is one study, again, you can show this, that, um, wh where we manipulated optic flow. And uh, one of the things that we did was we uh, got them to do a self-paced time trial, um, worked out what their average speed was, um, and we allocated, uh, they, they, they performed three different conditions, optic flow where we, we slowed it down by 15%, um, kept it reflected with their actual speed or sped it up by 15%. We asked them to um, pace themselves to a fixed speed based on their average speed. It's kind of roughly what it looks like. It's a bit more refined than this. This is one of the pilot pictures we took in the end. So there's no information display and stuff. And then... And then this is what we found. So what we found was that in the uh, slow optic flow condition, RP was actually lower, uh, which is quite interesting. It means that by manipulating external factors, you can provoke a difference in RP. Again, it's quite similar to the kind of thing that problem that Sam's been um, thinking about, which is that actually sometimes RP might be... I mean, Sam would say it's independent of... Uh, I think Sam would say it's independent of afferents that... RP is not just simply a kind of integrated and recoded version of all the afferent signals that are fed up from the periphery. Also, what's important here is extraceptive. So what's going on in the outside world? And this is where the difference between sensation and perception becomes important because, yes, the sen sensation might be the same, but the way you perceive that sensation can be quite different, can lead to a, a difference. Um, one example is tickling, right? So uh, I don't know if any of you are ticklish in here, but it's quite likely that if you are ticklish, you can tickle yourself, right? You can get someone else to tickle you in an almost identical way. In other words, the sensation itself is identical. The interpretation and the perception of it is completely different. It evokes a completely different response. So I think we probably get a bit of this in, 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 uh, in RPE. Uh, so Samuel's work there. So, um, so let me just show you how powerful this effect is on perception. Now, it won't, won't tell you much about perception of speed, won't tell you much about perception of effort because you're not cycling, but um, let me just play you a little bit of this. This is a very short video, but you'll get the idea. So you can alter, you can also alter optic flow by blinkering people. So you can see just the difference that different speed has on people. It's, it's, it's dramatic perceptual difference that it has. That affects RP, that's what we, what, we, what we kind of found. I mean, we all start RP in a different way in this study, but it does kind of broadly demonstrate this effect. So now we come on to decision-making. So even if we get, even if we can agree that RPE is an important regulator of pace, um, an important perception that causes us to make decisions, how do we actually then make decisions? Well, one theory, probably one of, the, one of the oldest theories of decision making, is bounded rationality. And the idea of bounded uh, rationality is that decisions are, uh, are essentially uh, constrained by three things. Right? One is that you have partial, unreliable, or complex information. That seems quite representative of what we've got. Two is that you have limited co cognitive capacity to deal with all of that information. And three, you have limited 
time to decide. Well, bounded rationality works if you are able to um, accurately model in your mind all of the possible outcomes. Right? So, you, so um, for instance, um, a, a chess player, for instance, um, cannot do that because there's just so many. But yet, yeah, a chess player can still beat a computer that can do that. So, a chess computer will will, will adopt a different approach to the chess problem than a than, than a, a grandmaster. A grandmaster will play on principles. So they they don't model every possible outcome before they make a move. They might look, you know, five, six, sometimes ten moves ahead, but they will make their decision about a move based on some principles, some principles of space and time and all that kind of thing. Right? So that type of decision making is called heuristic decision making. And that's quite interesting because it means that athletes can, it, it means that people make, can make good decisions sometimes based on actually relatively few number of cues and without necessarily knowing what all the possible scenario outcomes are. And yet they can somehow navigate themselves through this scenario and still um, be successful. So that's probably quite relevant to athletes because their environments are very, very um, complicated. Right, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to just ignore this study um, because I want to... I mean, oh, this, I'll just show you this slide because it's quite quick. We, we got children to pace themselves in the same way as before, but we asked them to pace themselves according to distance and according to a time-matched event. So... So we, we got them all to run, uh, I can't remember what the distance was, it was uh, 750 metres, I think, and then we timed them all, and then we asked them to pick times out of a hat. They thought they were randomly picking some time out of a hat. Actually, actually the time they were picking was matched to the actual, actual time they'd run in that fixed distance. And then we looked at what happened to their pacing, and they found it much more difficult to pace to time rather than distance. But crucially, because we videoed this, we got some sort of... Sort of serendipitous outcome of this study. We got some information about their information seeking behaviour and we particularly got information about how often they look to their watches. What you see is the closer they get to the end, the more they seek information essentially in, in the time condition. So we're back to this issue of in attempting to make rational decisions about pace, athletes have a tendency to seek reference information. And that's that's kind of that's kind of quite important because I think We've done a lot of deception studies now, we've done a lot of blinding studies, and you know, while those studies have their place, and I've done lots as well, and they're very interesting and they can tell us quite a lot, the conclusions from these studies, well really they've just been staggering actually. And one of, the, one of my concerns about these studies is that we, in, we infer too much about mechanisms based on deception and blinding studies. Let me just give you an, an analogy. It's, it's kind of, the logic is similar to this. If, if you're presented with a car and you're asked to work out how it moves forward, you take the wheels off and then discover the car can't move forward, and your inference is, ah, it must be the wheels that make the car move forward. And we have to be very, very careful of that kind of logic. And to some extent, this is what's been going on in the deception and blinding approaches in terms of inferences about what that data actually means. So what we need to do is think about new methodologies. Right? We need to think about tackling this problem from a different, different kind of way. I don't know why that picture's gone, but... Oh, God. Sorry. Right, so in this picture um, is, a, is, a, is a study that we've been doing recently, which is using an eye tracker. So essentially what we're getting these subjects to do, we get an expert time trial cycles, who are very good club time trial cycles, and complete novices. They can cycle, but they're novices. And we put an eye tracker on them, and then we're displaying a range of information in front of them on the screen. And then we're measuring what it is that they're looking at during a, in this case, a 10 mile time trial. This is what we found. So what cues, is there a difference between experts and novices and what cues they attend to? Come on, work. So this is what we found. So the black line is the expert time trial cyclist, first time trial, and the grey line is the novices. So First thing to note is that for over 30% of the time, the experts are looking at speed information, followed by other. Other was a code that we used when they were like looking at the floor or some other thing, and then distance. Right? So these are three pieces of information they're looking at. Novices, on the other hand, are looking at distance a lot, and speed. But well, speed's way down. They're not even looking at speed. Look at power a little bit, but you know, predominantly they're looking at distance. They're very focused on the end. Right. 
these experts are very focused on their speed. So perhaps that's a reflection of the experts being a little bit more performance orientated and the novices being a little bit more um, endpoint orientated. Uh, when we look at the second time trial, um, we, we get a bit of a learning effect in the novices. Now, now they're starting to look at speed a little bit as well. So we've still got this sort of same pattern with the no experts looking at speed and distance quite high up there. But novices still looking at distance as a primary source of information. But then speed, speed's been promoted. They're now starting to look at speed a little bit as well. So there's kind of a learning effect in these novices in terms of the type of information that they're looking at. Different fixation times. So one interesting thing is that um, <coughs> primary source of information, the experts tend to fixate on this information for much longer as a, as a percentage of, of time, or in this time it's at absolute time. And interestingly, they look at it for less frequently. Okay, it's a logical interaction there, but the point is, is that they know what they're, you know, this might be an indication that they know exactly what information they look at and they look at it and concentrate on it. Whereas the novices, they're not quite sure what cues to pick up on. Right? Is very, this is, none of this is published yet. It's literally, literally hot off the press. So does that make a difference to their pacing decision? Well, I mean, this is really... We don't, I don't have all... You know, I'm a PhD student who's working on this stuff at the moment, but one of the things that we tried to do was to think about, well, what happens to visual information at and immediately before an athlete changes their pace? Now, we use a very crude method of working out when they change pace, which was... Know, above one standard deviation of their average power or below one standard deviation for a downward shift in pace and I'm, I, I, can, I can almost feel Louis wincing because I know that he's doing his he does this sort of amazing stuff with exposure variance analysis but this was a really just a crude method to start off with to try to just work out whether there's a change in pace actually trying to work out if there's a meaningful change in pace is a horrendously difficult problem um, and so like, this is one subject, one expert subject in trial one, and this is their second trial. And in this particular trial, they increased pace three times and decreased it two times using our thing. And, and the interesting thing is what they're looking at. So this is what they were looking at at the point we identified a change in pace. And this is what they were looking at five seconds beforehand. So I accept that these eye tracking studies, a huge amount of assumptions about decision making because you know are they making decisions based on what they're looking at don't know really but interestingly a good percentage of it 40 percent of it of what they're looking at 50 percent in the second trial of what they're looking at five seconds before they actually implement a change in pace is speed in the experts which is quite interesting information i think so we have more direct measurement at least of what they're looking at now we need to try and work out how that information is affecting their decision making so, so these, these kind of sort of methodologies, I think, that we could use, you know, to you know complement deception studies and blinding studies to try to try to tease out a bit more and understand a bit more about mechanisms of decision making. Of course, there is another thing. Um, there is another. There is another complication with this stuff, which is that um, doing nothing is also a decision. <laughs> And that's, that's much more difficult to do. So if you get no change in pace, that might be a decision, but how you measure that is really, uh, I mean, that's really difficult. But an athlete might look at all, a load of information and then not change their pace, but that is actually a decision as well. But we'll do what we can for now, which is um, actual changes in pace. I said I was going to talk briefly about um, individual differences. This was a study we did in um, f five kilometer uh, cycling time trials and in 100km um, ultramarathon runners. We gave them uh, a scale called a dose birth scale which enables us to work out their tendencies towards um, uh, taking risks and also their perceptions of risk. Um, it's a very well validated and fairly standard kind of scale. Um, and this is, we, we, also, we also asked them to predict their pace as well. So this is this is about uh, this was it uh, sort of again a very sort of thinly veiled attempt to try to work out you know whether or not their perspective thought was accurate. Um, and so we gave them this kind of task using an Excel macro which enabled them to predict pace and then we compared it. So just to show you some of these uh, results, so um, we grouped our subjects according to 
low and high risk perception according to their questionnaire responses and then we looked at differences in their pacing profile and actually what we found was that the um, uh, subjects that had a higher perception of um, risk tended to adopt a slower starting pacing strategy so it's quite interesting so an individual trait um, about their, their how they perceive risk and then how that transpires in terms of what actual pacing strategy that they adopt. This was in five kilometre time trials, that's quite interesting. And also, you know, I'm, we haven't really got time to talk about this now, but there were also quite big differences in both of these groups in terms of what they predicted. We also saw this in ultra marathon runners. So those with higher perceptions of risk, the ultra marathon runners with higher perceptions of risk, tended to adopt uh, a slower starting pacing strategy, which is quite interesting. So risk is also quite important. Risk perception, individual dips is also quite important to pacing value. So let's just bring this to some kind of summary. So um, models where RPE drives pace generally fail to account for non-interoceptive -inter source influences on RPE. I think that's probably fairly true. Deception blindness studies have shown uh, these things, provokes information and reference seeking information, results in different pacing responses and possibly decisions. Um, perceptions though, exertion do seem to be a bit more than integrated and recoded afferents. Um, extraceptive information, um, uh, emotion, effects, prior experience, all of these things also change the way that we um, perceive sensations. Pace planning and effort involves prospective simulation and if you have an unrepresentative simulation for whatever reason, perhaps a poorly coded prior memory or something like that, that might lead to a poor pacing decision. Um, pacing decisions are probably made based on few cues. It's probably quite likely that athletes use heuristics rather than bounded rationality as a, as a way of making their decisions. Um, experts look at performance cues more than novices, um, um, possibly. Uh, High risk perceivers tend to adopt a slower starting pace than low risk perceivers, perhaps indicating that traits influence the decision making process as well. And there are, there are differences in both of these groups in terms of uh, predicted versus actual pacing, which really, I guess, just goes to exemplify how inaccurate and how imperfect this kind of prospective simulation can be sometimes. And the final point, which I really want to say is that I do, th I do think that we need to th start thinking in the pacing world about using some different methodologies to try to explain test um, mechanisms because I think in the models that we have at the moment, as good as they are, I think there are quite a lot of assumptions that are untested in these models that we need to, we need to interrogate a bit more essentially. And that's